This is Tommy's Outdoors 54. You know how people are having a journal where they're making notes about the animals they've seen, birds they, they watched, like bird watchers or anglers? They're also known for recording the fish they caught and the weather conditions that were in a particular day and tide and so on and so forth. But also other outdoors people, hunters, hikers, there is a group of people who just like to record what they've seen, they, whether they've seen a deer or a badger or some rare species of bird. And they're using different methods for recording those. Some of them are using just pen and paper. Some of them are using computers, their spreadsheets and like. Some of them are using special apps. And of course, there are apps for recording stuff like that. But there's also a website, the National Biodiversity Data Center website. And on that website, you can put all your sightings, your records of your fish and mammals and birds and the like, in general wildlife. You can not only record that, you can explore that on the map where you've seen them, what day you've seen them, etc., etc. But that's not only for you. By doing that through the National Biodiversity Data Center, you're also providing that data to the scientists. And that allows them to catalog animals and what species we have and use statistical analysis to draw trends and see whether a population on, of any particular animal is going up or down or what's the density and so on and so forth. So by doing so through National Biodiversity Data Center, you're not only creating your own records that you can use for whatever you want, but you're also contributing to citizen science. It's called citizen science, which is gathering scientific data through initiatives that you and I can take part in. So in this episode, I am talking with Dave Wall, who is citizen science officer at the National Biodiversity Data Center, about various subjects. We talk about the National Biodiversity Data Center itself and obviously how it works and why you should record sightings of wildlife in that database. But I also talk with Dave about what they actually see in the database with relation to population and trends of various animals. Um, so we talk about deer and we talk about six gill sharks and we talk about seals and many other animals. So if you like wildlife and you're interested in what is the status, trends, and density of population of various animals. And perhaps on top of that, you are a person who records those sort of information for your own purpose. Or perhaps you just want to contribute to citizen science projects and start recording that information. This is definitely an episode that you should listen to. So ladies and gentlemen, our guest today is Dave Wall from the National Biodiversity Data Center. Welcome to the show. Thanks. Uh, glad to be here. Yes, uh, I'm glad to be here. Uh, I'm in a, just for our listeners, I'm in the offices of uh, Biodiversity Ireland Data Center. What's the, what's the proper name? It's the National Biodiversity Data Center. Right, National Biodiversity Data Center. And uh, like we spoke over the phone and I said, like, I, I, ha I have you guys on the radar for, for some time. Uh, and, you know, the, the opportunity arises now to talk to you. You're, you're actually uh, doing workshop on either learning landscapes. So I'm looking forward to that workshop. Um, so I, I, there's a lot of talks about biodiversity and I just hope to we're gonna dive into that and, and you know where it sits in the whole landscape of things that are happening. But maybe let's start off with from your mouth, what is National Biodiversity Data Center and what you do in this organization here? OK, who are we and what do we do? Yes. Um, well, what we do is our role is really to collect information on species, distributions 
uh, in Ireland. So we collect records of species any and all species, hmm. uh, whether it be plants or insects or mammals or marine life. Uh, we take that data in. Uh, it comes in really in two forms. It make the, Some of the data comes in as data sets, which have been compiled by researchers or state agencies or whoever. Mm-hmm. And those data sets come in and they're stored here. Um, in some cases, we have citizen science projects, which actually we collect the data so we act as a portal Mm -hmm. so people can submit their sightings of whatever it can be dragonflies it can be bees uh, it can be squirrels that data comes into us through our website we validate that data what does that mean it means we look at the data we use experts to assess whether the information is correct so whether we believe uh that Mm -hmm. the species that the person has reported is actually what they saw. Mm-hmm. Um, Have you? Is it often that you get reported something that is outrageous? It's not so much outrageous. I mean, like a Bigfoot kind of thing, or, <laughs> no, or, no, or, or no. a species that there's no way of being in. No, Ireland. no Bigfoots. But I mean, you know, what we get is a lot of the common species. So a lot of foxes, something like eleven thousand fox records, um, thousands and thousands of plant records every year. Um, so we get a lot of the common species, and then less of the rarer species as mm. you would expect um so for the common species validation is is generally quite quick and easy because they're widely distributed mm-hmm. people easily recognize these species for the rarer species they're often harder to identify as well so we have to scrutinize those to make sure those records are correct um generally in some cases people just press the wrong button when they submit that mm-hmm. we've all done that uh, in other cases people uh submit a record for a species and they've misidentified it so we'll mm-hmm. pick that up during the validation process oh. and that's fine as well because i mean everyone's on a learning curve for identification mm-hmm. no matter who you are you know i may know a lot about marine species and dragonflies i know a lot less about plant species for example mm-hmm. so if i submit a plant species record it's quite prone to error yes. so i take comfort in the fact mm-hmm. that someone's checking that sure, before sure, it goes sure. through to the main data set so our main kind of interface with the public is through our website, biodiversityireland.ie. And on that site, we've two mapping systems. The first one is the citizen science mapping system. So you submit a, a record. Let's say you find, mm-hmm. you see an otter down mm-hmm. by the shore near Tralee somewhere. You submit that online, goes into our uh, citizen science portal, and it's instantly mapped. So mm-hmm. you can see it straight away on our citizen science portal on a map of Ireland. Mm. Then it goes through a validation process. And once it's validated, then it goes into the main biodiversity mapping system. And that's the mapping system we use and the data system we use when data is requested from us. So if it's for a policy or a research purpose, that's the data that goes out. So it's been validated by experts. Okay. And are you guys doing any research yourself on on that data or is it just just the collection collecting the data? The main role is to collect the data, Mm -hmm. but yes, the data is used for various, maybe used for reporting or maybe used for research. Some of the reporting we're involved in, in in mapping it and analyzing it. Mm -hmm. In other cases, we may collaborate with groups. In other cases, the data goes out for third party use. Um, so there's various roles there because like like I was I was saying like we walked out into, into the room and you know, I saw the microscope and a speci- specimen of, of uh, bees I think you know bamboo bees and you know, it was like wow I'm in the right place it's oh, awesome and, and like the whole the whole building the whole place is, is is you know for people who are like like me who like nature and and wildlife in general is just awesome because you have all these posters on the walls with different species of bumblebees and butterflies and whales and all that is like oh man it's awesome place. that's it so i mean it, it's um like with any kind of office people have specialities in different areas so bumblebees is definitely not my thing um but my main focus is on citizen science, mm-hmm. on marine species, and on dragonflies and damselflies. So that's they're the kind of areas I look towards. But I, right. I have a general um, expertise in mammal. Okay. Uh, biology so what's well. going on, like for example, in this office is is uh, identification of the species and the the, the job that you're described that people submitting something and then experts sitting here and saying like, well, you know, that's. 
you know, because I'm, I'm imagine maybe that's a question because I imagine like most of the people will will submit the species as like, oh, it's a wasp, right? Yeah. And then it's like, okay, but what kind of wasp? wasp and and then yeah. then it's the whole process starts. I mean, so essentially, you're asking, what do we do all day? Well, I mean, it varies. We we've a, a certain amount of outreach, especially in citizen science. So we go out and we do workshops. Um, we have a whole series of training workshops mm -hmm. um, organized by Ben Malone here, who's our outreach officer, um, where we actually go out and train people up in species identification survey okay. techniques. Um, we have then the data validation and analysis roles. So we go to our data sets and we, we validate those data or we send the data out. If we can't do it in-house, we'll mm -hmm. send it out to third parties to validate uh, third-party yeah. experts. Um, we have the mapping um, system. We also have reporting, various reporting requirements that have to be met. So we, we spend some of our time doing that. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, there's various roles going on. Right. But, uh, most of it centers around the data. But, we, I mean, in, in more recent times, we also have the Irish pollinator plan that's ongoing. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of more of a practical conservation role yes. to that, yeah. um, going beyond the data. Mm -hmm. into practical measures around the country for Irish pollinators. Sure, sure. So you also, you, I presume you're also building like expertise within the organization rather than only collecting data so, so you, you can be referred to by the policymakers or somebody else in, in that regard. Yes, I mean, for, for biodiversity information, for mm -hmm. biodiversity requirements, a lot of the uh, government agencies would look to us um, sure. to help them fulfill those oh. requirements yeah. and so so i always ask that question my guess like how you get how did you get into to that job like what 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 happened because it seems like i i tend to interview people who like in my view have a, like a greatest job in the world all right and uh so i was like well how did that happen that you ended up in in working for biodiversity crikey that's a long story so i went to university 25 almost 30 years ago, <laughs> no, 25 years ago. Um, after graduation, I kind of, I went out uh, volunteering initially. So, mm -hmm. you, you know, you need uh, experience is quite important as well as academic um, mm -hmm. qualifications. So I, I spent a few years volunteering and anything from whale and dolphin surveys to badger uh, research mm -hmm. out in Austria. And I, I worked in West Cork and Shirkin Island Marine Station for almost a year mm -hmm. uh, surveying otters. And then kind of my first job, I suppose, was consultancy mm -hmm. uh, as a wildlife consultant, mainly on... Wow terrestrial animals so what it, does wildlife consultant does? so it, a large part of the job as a wildlife consultant was going around uh, for largely at that time it was road developments so doing surveys ahead of the roads uh, being built okay. looking for species that were protected such as badgers and mm -hmm. um, so if we found badger sets within the the development footprint we may have to move them mm -hmm. um, or rehome them that kind of thing oh. um after that, then... There was no question of actually changing the plans of building a road, right? It's It depends, but quite often it, it, it was mitigation. So it was, it was really mm -hmm. uh, ensuring that the animals weren't harmed mm -hmm. rather, than, rather than diverting a road mm -hmm. uh, as such. Sure. It would, I suppose it would depend if you found an extremely rare habitat or species roads have been. Uh, change and plans have oh, been changed okay. in those cases it's not always a case that's of that's shoving, shoving them aside that's but encouraging that's yeah yeah, encouraging. yeah it very much depends on on, on the species mm -hmm. involved sure after that then i got a, a kind of side by side with that role I, I started doing more and more um marine mammal survey work i'd always mm -hmm. been involved in marine mammals since the mid 90s mm -hmm. uh, doing surveys and just that role picked up especially as the the Irish state research vessel came online um, in 2003, 2004, we started doing offshore surveys um, 
through the Irish Whale and Dolphin Group, mm -hmm. I suppose. So I spent, that kind of built up, and I ended up spending about 10 years working offshore, doing marine mammal wow. uh, mapping and surveys. So it was, uh, for many years, it was... It, so were you like based on the ship and you go uh, sail out and you were, how long would you stay at the sea? Anywhere from two to six weeks. Wow, that's, a, that's on, a serious... Depending on, wow. the, on the trip. And it, that was mostly mapping and survey work. And then as, as that kind of wound up, uh, I went into commercial marine mammal uh, monitoring and mitigation work mm -hmm. that was associated with oil and gas surveys. Mm -hmm. So we'd go out and we'd... Um, try and ensure that the areas were clear of marine mammals before they started firing air guns for oil and gas surveys so well, i did how that do you, how do you ensure that the basically surveying um either acoustic uh, visual survey or acoustic survey so okay. a, a lot of the work i was doing was um acoustic surveying so we'd have hydrophones in the water we'd be yes. listening for the animals yeah and if you find the animals then what then we'd make the uh, oil and gas uh surveyors very unhappy by stopping them <laughs> okay okay no, <laughs> or that, preventing that, them starting which was never popular but that, 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 that was no, our but, role <laughs> but that makes sense because i i thought that then you kind of proceed with kind of uh, persuading those those animals to kind of move them move no, away no, from no, the no. area you, i was like Whoa, you just you... had to bide your time and wait for them to go right um so was it happening often that you actually stopped oil and gas operation yes yeah in some cases um depending on the area some areas you'd have very low sightings rates in other areas um there's, there were a few surveys there we had almost constant sightings and yes it became quite an issue but i mean it's not our problem we we just mm -hmm. do our job and yeah it's up to the uh, operators really to worry about the rest of it. Um, right, right. So our role isn't w out there wasn't to enforce; it was to monitor and to report. So okay. basically, we'd okay. tell them what the guidelines were. Okay. Uh, we'd inform them whether the area is clear or not, mm -hmm. um, and they'd either comply or not comply. And in fairness, they always complied because okay. um, in the environmental aspect of the surveys was quite important yeah. um to them you know in, in terms of reporting back because it, it's the, like in my in my mind is like that the oil and gas industry is like this big bulldozer that goes over everything and don't care about anything and here you said like no no they actually um you know take into account what we say that we saw the whales and so on and so on so that's encouraging to yeah well i mean they, you know, in Ireland, we had a, a set of regulations that had to be adhered to, and that was reported back to the the survey regulator, um, which was in one of the government departments. So obviously, if they didn't comply, that would be flagged up and there'd be mm -hmm. issues. It, but even so, I mean, generally, I think maybe in the early years, there was a lot of dismissive approaches maybe to marine mm -hmm. mammal mitigation but certainly you know by the time i was doing it um kind of 2010 onwards mm -hmm. maybe um oh, it was standard in the industry and once the, something becomes standard in the industry yeah. it tends to get questions less yes um so th they knew they were there they yeah. knew they had to comply and it was, they may not have liked it but they, they yeah. did it and have you ever had a kind of uh let's say suggestions like hey dave could you pretend that you did not see that whale over there no no there's no. never any of that um sure you get a bit of argy vargy sometimes because you know those guys are under pressure you're looking at mm -hmm. ships potentially being chartered at a quarter of a million dollars mm -hmm. a day mm -hmm. there's a lot of money involved but no um g generally very very few problems okay. okay um and you know as long as you're working on professional survey vessels yeah you know they, oh. they they did their job okay so you had you've been on the vessel that was dedicated to surveys yeah it was not like you were one guy on the on a vessel that is used for oil oil and gas and you just oh no no i was yeah oh, yeah you might like be that. generally you'd be a part of it maybe a team of four okay um because most of these surveys are quite large vessels so mm -hmm. generally a team of four because they had to provide 24 hour cover both visual mm -hmm. and acoustic oh, okay Mm. So, all right so so you're on those so you were working on those vessels. so just did all that for about 10 years and then came back on shore mainly because the kids arrived mm. <laughs> and 
something. Yeah. Spending... I can imagine it's kind of it, it puts a strain on on your yeah, on your space. relation and like you you've gone for six weeks at a time that's, and that that's repeats it. it's a repeatable process. Right? Yeah, and I mean it's it's not nice to come home and your kids barely recognize you. So mm. yes, that that kind of put the kibosh on that. And it was kind of lucky in a way because the the bottom fell out of the oil and gas industry pretty much around the same time. So a lot of oh. those jobs went at that time. Okay. Um, due to the drop in oil prices so um, okay. I came ashore and then I worked for four years uh, in Northern Ireland with Ulster Wildlife uh, doing community engagement work mm-hmm. and then at the start of this year I started up with uh, the National Biodiversity Data Centre okay. on an EPA funded project looking at aquatic species so we're looking at one part of the project is looking at dragonflies and damselflies and the other part of the project is looking at coastal green species with a Mm -hmm. focus really on intertidal uh, species recording. Mm -hmm. Um, I suppose one issue we've, we've noticed in the, in the biodiversity data centers, we we do have, um, I suppose a a lack of marine records. I'll give you an example. So Mm -hmm. beetle at an enemy, I'm sure you'll be familiar with the little red jelly blobs Mm -hmm. that sit in the, uh, on the rocky shore, probably the most common species we have, or certainly one of the most common intertidal species we have. I think we've about 400 records. Mm-hmm. And if you compare that to foxes, we've 11,000 records, wow. even though foxes are nocturnal and not that easy to spot. So yeah. I think, you know, in Ireland, certainly there's been a long history of terrestrial species recording and data submission, um, but not so much on the rain front. So we're, we're mm-hmm. looking to up the, the level of um, yeah. records on in that area as well. And that project is also looking at using species, both the dragonflies and the coastal marine species as indicator species for water quality and for climate change. Yes. So yes. We'll be looking at that as well. So, so tell me, so the, 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 the work of the, the gathering of the data has the purpose of actually figuring out like what is the density of species, how many there are in the area, right? Not necessarily okay. a census. Um, quite often, it's okay, distribution. Not, not the census. It's more of a distribution. It, it depends. It depends. If different surveys will collect different levels of data. I suppose the main information that comes out is distribution of species, so where they're found across uh, Ireland or through our mm-hmm. offshore area. Um, the other thing it tells us is... I suppose it gives us relative abundance in that you'll you'll get sightings per, let's say, 10 kilometer grid square, which will mm-hmm. give you a good indication of where things may be more abundant than not. Mm-hmm. But in in many cases, we do actually collect count data as well. Okay. Um. So yeah, it has it has various uses, and in some cases we we will structure a survey so it can be used to estimate numbers. But more often than okay. not, especially with the kind of casual um records that we mm-hmm. get in through the website it's you're looking at distribution and relative abundance okay information. because surely you, you you need to then do a lot of like a data processing and using some sort of a statistical method because you might have a one area where you have a just like like a bunch of people who are keen on the project exactly. and then you have an area where no one gives a damn exactly right exactly and that's 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 always one of the issues is data gaps we, we have quite a few areas where uh, we either for various reasons, don't have people collecting information. And we're always trying to fill those mm-hmm. data gaps so we can get as good an overall picture mm-hmm. as possible. What would be the that area? Oh, well, it depends on species. Okay. Um, so, yeah, so for marine species, it's everywhere. Okay. <laughs> well, it's not quite everywhere. <laughs> but, yeah, we, uh, we, we are always looking for more marine species data. Mm-hmm. Um, for terrestrial species, it, it just depends on the species. You know, obviously, areas with low uh, population density, human population density, you'll have lower okay. recorder. Areas that are difficult to access, you know, upland yeah. areas, bogs, those kind of right, areas. Right, right, right. Do you have areas where it's like a bog? bunch of very eager people and you have like a there are absolutely like a, yeah, yeah. both loads of data like no no guys you stop sending me those <laughs> those those fox sightings i know there are there, foxes there's there. there's definitely areas where there's very active recording groups as uh, some of the wildlife groups are fantastic i mean they're out there they're all day every mm-hmm. day recording mm-hmm. and they generate vast amounts of records um yes so you have to take that into account during the analysis okay, as okay, well yeah okay. for sure just is like a I'm just wondering, like, how how big is that part of of what you guys doing? Like a like a statistical 
analysis and, and data processing, which, which then has nothing to do with the lovely posters on the wall, because that's, you know, kind of like a academic, strictly academic, like how, how big of a part of, of, of what you do is that? It, it again depends on the project for some projects we might have a reporting function where we have to report back results um, and it'll require statistical analysis for other in other cases we're, we're simply providing data to mm -hmm. other users and they'll do the analysis and they'll look at okay. the, the okay. information there so okay so look i have a i have a number of questions related to speed i know that you're specializing in marine and and but I'm just going to throw it out there and maybe, you know, so the first question I, I have about the census and it's about deer population. Do you, do you, do you have like, because like this is, and the reason I'm throwing deer as a first species is for the benefits of, of, of all the listeners, because I know there's a lot of people from, you know, who are hunters and uh, there are different opinions. Like one, one common opinion is like, oh, there's like a crap load of deer. There's deer everywhere, right? Then you hear like, no, deer are getting pushed. There's a poaching going on. There's this many thousand killed everywhere. There's, you know, the, the increase in the number of hunters is much bigger than the increase in the number of deer. And like, and then you have like a middle ground. It's like, well, we have no idea. There was no census done. And it's like, but you, I think what you're doing is like as close as it gets to you know, have that some sort of the idea. Mm, it, probably your third opinion there was the closest truth in that if you want a accurate understanding of the population of a particular species or group of species, you need to do a structured survey. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of what we do, as I said, is focus on distribution and relative abundance of species. Um, a lot of our kind of outputs in terms of information is in trends so we may mm. say a species increasing a species decreasing a species is stable that's based on um the data we get in and in some cases having a fixed network or as wide a network as possible of mo annual monitoring sites mm. which will enable us to determine trends in the data if you want actual counts uh, quite often it requires a dedicated population survey mm -hmm. and certainly for deer that's one of one of the things we, we have very few actual population assessments for our mammal species um okay. because yeah it's it's quite a big role it's it, it's it's a huge you know as as an undergrad and partially as postgrad i studied foxes um and even just look at foxes in in dublin the amount of effort that you required to try and get some assessment of population was enormous, you know, yeah. because you, you had to really, it wasn't just a case of collecting records. You had to go and look, you had to know where you'd look. Mm -hmm. So I suppose a good example might be the work I did on the marine mammals on the whales and dolphins mm -hmm. there. We were able to map relative abundance very well because we knew not just where we'd got records from because we'd done the, the survey work we also knew where we'd been and looked mm. and that's the critical information you need to know where you've looked because the the blanks are as important as the positives yeah so you need to know where you've been where you've looked where you found animals and where you haven't found animals mm -hmm. and then that will enable you to accurately determine um population estimates or relative abundance estimates if you don't know where you've looked mm -hmm. um then it's hard it's a harder trick to do mm -hmm. uh, so the the effort information is quite important as well okay so in other words there is so so sorry for deer yeah. yes i mean to i suppose to create a, a, a national deer management plan or whatever, probably you need a, a survey data. That's mm -hmm. the, that's the kind of data you're looking and, for. And why so. why it wasn't done? Why in no census was done? Is it well? I imagine resources are a large part. It, it's incredibly mm -hmm. expensive to do national surveys for any species, right. um, because you need to go out and cover the ground uh, or the water. Yeah. Um, so, for example. When I was working on marine mammal surveys, the only way we could feasibly do it was by using vessels that were heading out to sea doing something else. We couldn't afford to charter a vessel. It would yeah. cost you, 
if I wanted to charter the Celtic Explorer, let's say, mm-hmm. for a day, you're looking at 18,000 per day. 18,000. Yeah. It's a lot. So you add that up over needing to cover the whole sea area every month for maybe five years. It's astronomically expensive. Yes. So you have to, you know, if you want to go out and do a badger survey, you have to send people into the field mm-hmm. all across the country. So you have to have a sampling points and send mm-hmm. those people. Out. So any any full population survey is very, very, very expensive. Okay. So that's why in some cases it's it's cheaper to look at trends mm-hmm. in data and uh, relative assessments of population rather than actual counts. Sure, sure. So, 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 tell me, Dave, is, does it make any sense? You know, if if a hunter or angler comes back home, does it make any sense for him to log into your website and say, "Oh, I saw five deer and two foxes," right? And the next, you know, day. He goes to the same place and he says, like, hey, I saw three deer and two fox. Like, does it, is this the data that you're looking for or is it just creates noise and you're not really? No, absolutely. It's, it's, it's a good idea for anyone who's out and involved with a particular species group to submit their, their records because um, that gives us more information. More information is very valuable. We, all, we generally say if, if you're working in the same area um, on a regular basis, you know, we would tend to say, you may submit your records every fortnight or even once a month in some cases mm-hmm. because that that repeat survey data or that repeat record data is quite valuable in for example dragonflies and damselflies they've set flight periods mm-hmm. so different species have different flight periods so unless people kind of submit records on a fairly regular basis we, we don't get a clear picture of what those flight periods might might be or how they might differ across the country. So mm-hmm. it, it's it's quite valuable for us, let's say, if you have a lake in your front garden, that you submit your records every two weeks. So we get a picture of how that changes over mm-hmm. time because you'll have different species appear. But every two weeks, I mean, time. like, whatever happening throughout those two weeks? N- no, or, kind or of. Or was it like y- every two weeks on that day? Something like that, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, so it's not like you're collecting it, your data for two weeks every day no, and then submit no, everything no. Okay, so okay. Kind so it's of, like a spot check, uh, almost. kind of a spot I'm check. I'm coming yeah. in always on the on the yeah. first on Monday, you know, every two weeks, and whatever I see that day, I submit. That, that's quite useful to us as well in in okay. determining um, what we call the phenology, or basically h- how the species either grows over uh-huh. the seasons or is active over the seasons. It gives us that kind of information, sure. which is useful as well. But if you submit, if you you look out your back garden, you submit the same. Let's say you have a tree in your back garden, you submit mm-hmm. that every day. Well, it, we don't get a whole heap of information from Exa- that. Well, exactly. Know, so. <laughs> because, I can, uh, you know, I, I think about my buddies and, and myself, you know, hunters yeah. and anglers, and we spend a lot of time outdoors. Mm. And we, you know, we could submit something every day, but then the question is, like, how useful that is, you know, if you're, like, I have a friend who is a great bass angler, mm. right? And we spoke about it, and, you know, I'm doing a bass angling as well, but he's, like, off the chart, Right. So he could come back and of these, you know, six marks that he fish, he could submit, you know, like a load of data every day. But then it's like, ah, maybe not. But if he can do that like every month. Exactly, exactly. Then you and, can and have an insight into this. Like, you know, he was saying to me like, well, you know, that mark, you, you don't go there because they only show up in April. Like, how do you know? Oh, because he was there in January and February and March not catching anything and he knows that there show up in april there and that's the sort of information that you're looking for there's then. a perfect example yes so you, you particularly in, in marine species they may turn up at different times in different areas so having that regular submission of information is is very very useful mm-hmm. and for marine species in general as i say we're, we're, we're we need more data so and that coastal that inshore um area if you think about it, we have a lot of commercial fishery surveys offshore, mm-hmm. maybe running into 50 or 30 meters water depth. Beyond mm-hmm. that, the, the big ships can't survey. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we've terrestrial information, but we've not a lot from the bit in between. Mm-hmm. And that goes for all species. So data from sea anglers, data from whoever is out and about on the coast is really, really important to us okay. to enable us build up a much better and much clearer picture of what we've got really what we're looking to do in one way is build a solid baseline data set for mm-hmm. where we have different species 
Um, mm-hmm. When they occur, um, what kind of habitats they occur in. Mm-hmm. And then from that, we can look towards developing a monitoring scheme and determining trends. But if you have no solid baseline data, you yeah. can't look at trends because you don't know where you're starting from. And you're only working on creating that baseline. So, I mean, like, do you, do you have a baseline from 30 years ago or 50 years ago? Is there any historical baseline? For marine species, I mean, for terrestrial species, yes. For marine species, by and large, no. Okay. Um, the areas where you'll have baseline data sets going back over a period are things like commercial fishery surveys. But for intertidal, especially, mm-hmm. we have very little data. We have two data sets in the whole country which run back over more than, let's say, 10 or 15 years. And that's at Shirk and Iron Marine Station. And there's another data set from Kinsale Harbor. Mm-hmm. Beyond that, we do not have long-term data sets mm-hmm. um, for intertidal marine species or even for coastal marine species for you know to a large degree. So you only get that kind of information where people have a long track record of recording. Sure. Um, and that's what we're trying to build here. So we have a project, one of the, one of the projects I'm um, coordinating is a project called Explore Your Shore. And what we're asking people to do is head down to the shore, and which a lot of people do anyway. They might be angling, they might mm-hmm. be surfing, they might mm-hmm. be walking, they might be snorkeling. Yeah, People go to the shore for a million different reasons. Yeah. But what they haven't been doing is recording what they see. Mm. And what we're trying to do is encourage people when you're down the shore you, you go rock pooling for an hour well enjoy the rock pooling but at the end of it why not take pictures of what you've seen and submit them to us at the right. national biodiversity data center through exploreyourshore.ee which is our mm-hmm. website um, and then we can validate that data it gives us really useful information on where those species occur for a lot of our coastal marine species for a lot of our intertidal species we have a kind of a patchy map of where it right. occurs around the coast we want to fill in all the blanks sure sure in other words don't worry so much about the foxes and deer but the but the coast the the the, the what's what's happening in the intertidal that's that's very not important. saying that at all i think it's it's plus i mean we still okay. need to worry about the foxes and the deer mm-hmm. we still need to keep that data coming in so we maintain a good data set there but we particularly um for people living near the coast or active yeah. around the coast we need that coastal species information so we've we've a number of pro- projects we're ro- rolling out and what we've tried to do is make it fun and easy rather mm-hmm. than laborious and complicated mm-hmm. um so we've got a for example one of our services the big beach biodiversity survey so really what we're asking people to do is as they stroll down the beach which they tend to do anyway let's say for health or for walking the dog mm-hmm. is bring your camera with you your mm-hmm. smartphone every mm-hmm. smartphone now has a camera and take pictures of what you find along the strand line. So a lot of those would be seashells, bivalve shells. Mm-hmm. We have very little data on bivalve distributions in Ireland. Wow. Very little data. For some species, we've almost no records at all. Huh. So by taking photos of the shells you find as you stroll along the, the high water line or along the beach, um, you're collecting useful information. Because what you find watch up on the beach is going to reflect what's in the adjacent seas. Yes. So... It gives us information, not directly, but indirectly about what's underneath the bit we can't see, what's underneath the, the, the adjacent waters. Wow. Um, we have another survey, which is um, our Rocky Shore survey, which we'll be rolling out shortly, where we ask people essentially to do the same thing for Rocky Shores. We ask people to survey from high water to low water and record the different species they see there. Another one of our surveys is going to be asking people to record snapshots uh, photographs of various sessile species so the stuff you see clung to rocks mm-hmm. barnacles mm-hmm. limpets and uh, maybe species like seagrass as well asking people to take pictures of those at a particular resolution and submit those to us and then we'll analyze those in batches because in those particular cases species can be quite hard to identify mm-hmm. so we'll get experts to analyze those in batches um so we've those kind of projects ongoing um the most basic of our Explore Your Shore service is seashore snapshots. So you're out on the coast for any reason whatsoever, sea angling, whatever mm-hmm. it is. Um, you take a picture of what you see or you catch on your phone and you can submit it through seashore snapshots uh, to us. And each of those is a record. Each of those is becomes a data point, becomes mm-hmm. a mapping point for that species, mm. um, which is, again, incredibly useful in helping us build a data set there. And then once we have a good data set in, we can look at relationships 
uh, to things like water quality, habitat quality, uh, climate change. So, for yeah. example, if we get a good data set set up over the next five years, let's say, um, we can go back again in five years' time and see has that changed. Yes, see the trend. Um, exactly. So, you know, the longer term goal, I suppose, would be to try and establish some monitoring stations or monitoring points around the coast where we can look at how things change over time. Um, to enable us get some impression of how things are being impacted mm. by human activities one way or the other. Yeah. Well, I hope like uh, a lot of people who are listening to that podcast will will take to the shore and then take to the website and, and record record uh, their sightings. It, it's, record. it's really easy. I mean, uh, of course I'm going to say it's easy, but it is actually easy because we, we set it up that way. So in, in effect, a lot of it comes down to just being active and taking pictures of what you see. Mm. And then all we need to which know... Which people tend to do anyway. Which people tend to do anyway. And all we need to do, know on top of that is where you were, mm -hmm. what date you were there, who you are, mm -hmm. because we, we, you know, we need to know who the recorder is. Mm -hmm. um, and then you, you just submit the, the various species. It can be quite... It get quite addictive, quite honestly. Um, yes, I can, I, I can imagine that. You want to identify stuff. Yeah. Um, so... You know, did you did you did you get a feedback then saying like I submitted this you know shell or I submitted this this thing, and then did you get the information that that was actually you know this type of uh, you know coral or whatever? Yeah, I mean, what we do is because of the volume of records, we can't email everyone back. But you get a big thank you. The forum gives you a thank mm -hmm. you for mm -hmm. submitting your record. You're immediately able to see your your record mapped on our. Mm -hmm. uh, citizen science immediate portal. gratification immediate gratification <laughs> the citizen science portal also enables you to explore your own data so let's say you, you've been recording oh. for four or five years and you submitted okay. a thousand records so you can use it for your own you purpose. can use it to explore your own information so you can go in there you can log in it's based on your email address so if you use the same mm -hmm. email for each record submission you can go in there and explore your own records. You can map how your records have changed over time. Um, you can see distribution changes. You can explore yeah. all the information you've provided. And then you can go to the, the larger mapping system and see how your records yeah. relate to everyone else's records. So you yeah. can see how you relate to the bigger picture. I, I can see a few anglers right now sitting there and saying, like, I'm not giving out away my marks. A lot of a lot of people say that, but I can tell you, if you've got marks, most other people already know your marks. I mean, there's very few secrets in life. There's a lot of people going, oh well, we, we can't tell people where where that is. But sure, you Google it, and I can, mm -hmm. you know, in ninety percent of cases or ninety five percent of cases, you'll find out straight away where other people have caught stuff because with social media now, nobody keeps their mouth shut, so it yeah. tends to get out there anyway. Yeah. Um, so I mean it's but it's yeah, not it's but it's not explorable by mm. so if if I know email address of or 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 handle or nickname of my buddy who is fishing all the time yeah I cannot go in and, no you and, can't and, because and you, check what he was recording no not unless you have his password <laughs> okay 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 so no that but you know it might it might seem kind of silly but I yeah, I yeah. know that there's yeah. a lot of people who have those those thoughts immediately yeah okay so so that's that's good that's good to know. Um, listen, so let's, let's talk about the, uh, marine species. Hmm. I have a question about seals hmm. because that's another, that's another subject. Seals are protected animals. Are. Their, their numbers dropped. And so maybe you're going to explain in a second what was happening with the numbers of seals, how their numbers dropped or whatever. Right now, there's more often you hear the voices, oh, there's seals everywhere. We need to call seals. There's mm -hmm. like explosion of seals. So like mm -hmm. is is any, you know, because maybe it's local, maybe it's not local. Like, can you lay it out? What was the situation with seals and how it looks like right now? Well, I mean, seals are protected for a reason is, is that um historically they were exploited they were exploited for fur and for food mm -hmm. uh, mostly for fur for their coats seal mm -hmm. skin coats used to be quite a thing yeah and that's what what, you, what years was it no i mean you're you're talking kind of back in the 1800s but it, uh, into mm -hmm. the early 19 early to mid 1900s i mean it, there was okay. still seal calls occurring in ireland i think up until the 70s or 80s um 
1980s? I think so, yeah. Wow. yeah. Um, certainly earlier than that. The So all of those things had an impact on seal populations. So however big they are today, they used to be much larger. Mm-hmm. Um, but other things impact seal uh, populations as well, such as competition for food, such as um, bycatch in some cases, such as disease. Um, so for if you think about common seals, they're suffering a lot from things like um, folk on distemper, uh, which has wiped out uh, a lot of seals over the past couple of decades. Mm-hmm. So I suppose, are there lots of them? Well, I mean, they're returning to healthier population levels. Okay. So uh, we can see the population rebound. But there's an, a natural control mechanism for seals, which is food. I mean, mm-hmm. so I can recall one of my first jobs at a university um, was looking after seals up in Glen Bay. At the time, there was a big seal die off up in Tory, and it was probably related to the lack of food. Mm-hmm. And basically, they were starving to death. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's a kind of an inbuilt control mechanism there. But of course, seals come up sometimes in competition for various target species. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, that's that's the that's the that's a point of friction, it's right? It's a point of friction because usually I mean, it, that's, it, a, that's that's fishermen who want seal gone, right? Because yeah, they're directly yeah, competing yeah. for fish with them. Well, right? there you go. I mean, you know, it comes up to that old cartoon that you quite often see. You know, you, that seal stole my fish. Well, whose fish did it steal, and yeah. who's for stealing the fish? Yes. Um, what's actually <laughs> happening is both you and the seal are in competition, perhaps for the same fish. Um, who owns it? Well, that's a deep philosophical question yes. I'm not going to go into here. Yes. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's not all negative either. I mean, there have been studies on the impact of seals on fisheries, and invariably it's not a simple picture of all seals are bad and they're all mm-hmm. eating our fish. It's a much more complex thing. Mm. Seals live within a marine environment, a marine ecosystem, complex food webs. So quite often... Certainly, there was a Royal Canadian Commission, I think it was back in the 90s, I remember reading the results of that, and certainly they found that it it wasn't a clear picture at all, because as much as seals might impact on commercial fish, they also impacted on other, perhaps, predators of commercial fish species, Mm -hmm. or a large part of their diet was on non-commercial fish species. Mm -hmm. Um, So culling seals wouldn't necessarily bring about any major advantage in terms of uh, fish stocks because a lot yes they were taking some commercial species but they were also taking large amounts of other commercials of Mm non-commercial species or they may be helping control predators of commercial species so it's it's not a simple black and white picture yeah um and it never is in nature i mean people always see the direct a to B yeah, line. Yeah, yeah. But I'm they on, don't I'm appreciate on the, the, And I see all those seals <laughs> yeah. over there and they surely the, eat my fish. The, right? the like line is far from A to B. It's usually an extreme series of squiggles and interlocking yeah. um, a, a web. You know, it's yes. a food web. Yes, and it's seals, a web seals for a are just part of it. Um, so it's, yeah, it, it, it can be an issue. But I, I think by and large, it's it's perhaps overplayed. Certainly, there was there was also studies on the impact of seals on net fisheries. And it was found that, for example, brown crab mm-hmm. were having a far larger impact on uh, oh. on fish caught in nets than seals were. Uh, you know, so what are you going to do then? Blame all the crabs, you know? It, it, oh, how so? Crabs? Because they were pr- predating on fish that were caught in, uh, basically. Uh, uh, so, oh. for example, a, a fish net... Uh, you know, where you fish dangling dead or dying mm-hmm. from a net, that's basically dinner time for everything in the sea. So you have a whole yeah. range of species that might prey on those fish. Brown crabs or crab species were found to have a, a major um, detrimental impact on, on, on net fisheries, mm. far more so. I think it, the, the conclusion that our report is far more so than seals. Mm. Um, but of course, seals are big and easy to see, whereas crabs yes, are small exactly. and not seen at all. So exactly. it's it's easy to, to blame the big lump of a thing sitting on the surface chewing mm-hmm. on your dinner yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. rather than blaming yeah, something yeah. else. Okay. So I think for any of these things, there, there's, um, you know, there's a balance. But invariably, large animals, especially large predators, tend to get scapegoated. Yes. For a lot oh, that's, of that's a, a lot of conflict, things they're right? not necessarily responsible for. Yes. You know? Yes. Okay. Um that's that's interesting. Um 
I have a. I'm just gonna throw it before we, before we go into more into biodiversity itself. I'm just gonna throw a few few other questions related to species. And if you don't know, just tell me that you don't know. Um, Can I say pass? Yes. Yes. So <laughs> so the one that I'm expecting you to say pass, but maybe not, is a six gill shark. Mm. Do you have any any you know records and any? idea of the population of six gill sharks around no, the and i don't think anybody does i mean they're such an enigmatic species and they're so rarely seen mm. um i i've been on board vessels that have caught them as mm -hmm. bycatch um you know some of them generally i think they're deep water species so you tend to find them you know more off the probably off the shelf edge and uh, mm -hmm. into abyssal kind of waters uh, but I, I've seen them caught fairly close to land. Yes. Um, but there's so little data. I don't think right. you could say anything really constructive on the six gill sharks or their populations, other than we know they occur here. Mm -hmm. But in what numbers, I don't think anyone would have any idea. Yes, yes. And so if you have a species like that, and like, you know, it might be a little bit loaded question, but it comes truly from my you know, quest for, in for for knowledge. Like if you have a species of, of fish like six gill shark, which is which we don't really know, hmm. would you say like what's your view on recreational angling for those species? Would you are you more of the opinion like, oh, as long as you release that fish, it's you know, in the grand scheme of things, you're not you're not doing any damage. Or are you more on the side like, well, we don't know, you know, leave them alone? I suppose it's a good question. For a long time, it was always assumed that sea angling was such a minor impact in, com in comparison to commercial fishing that it wasn't worth worrying about. But I think that perception is changing. Um, certainly, if you look at some of the fisheries in the US, for example, the Goliath Grouper is a classic fishery mm -hmm. where sea angling recreation yes. angling has had a huge impact basically what happened was from the 70s 80s onwards um there was there was well even before that there was major sport fishing for glide grouper because yeah. they were huge and they were big uh, game fish and what happened was quite rapidly um and i do have a in one of the talks i give i've, I've a nice series of photos of catch landing photos from a, a commercial uh angling charter in florida mm -hmm. and it shows you his his catches uh you know from let's say the 60s into the 70s into the 80s and what happens quite rapidly through that in indeed within maybe five or ten years of him starting that charter was all the big fish were gone because yeah. he was he was landing everything because he caught. They're extremely slow growing right exactly um all the big fish were gone and at, as the years progressed what you were getting was just small you're getting the same numbers of fish but smaller yeah. much smaller yeah and that goes almost universally for mm -hmm. fisheries yeah. all the big animals are gone yeah yeah um and the problem there is 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 twofold number one you know quite often the small animals aren't reproducing yet uh, obviously they have a much lower commercial value so mm -hmm. bigger animals have a much higher commercial value than mm -hmm. smaller an animal fish and a huge problem is that in many marine species, if not most marine species, the big animals are much more fecund, much more productive than the smaller animals. So mm -hmm. a big fish mm -hmm. may lay a million eggs in a year. A small fish may only lay a thousand or a 10,000. Mm -hmm. So once you take the big animals out of the population that has a hugely disproportionate impact on the reproductive ability of that population. Mm -hmm. So big animals quickly removed, it hugely reduces the ability of that population to recover from fisheries impacts. Yeah. The Goliath grouper is a good example. I, I, Goliath I grouper is, is kind you, of a you classic can, example. You, I, I think you still can catch them, but you cannot remove them from the water. Mm. And yeah. I suppose our local example here is mm -hmm. cod. Um, mm. all the big cod are gone if you look back yeah. into records from the 50s 40s 30s and before you know five foot long cod weren't an unusual yeah. catch yeah um but today yeah. cod are maybe the length of your arm yeah and oh, I you was, can i was talking to anglers and hmm. said, like it's it's a, such a shame that people are going to norway fish for cod yeah 
while we you know in in the waters around ireland and, and british isles it, we should we used to have as big yes. or bigger cod yeah then you now need to travel to norway and you could trolley off the same kind of example across all fish species or most fish species even, even things as common as mackerel and herring you know the average size for mackerel and herring um is, is much smaller these days than it was historically mm -hmm. um you know turbot are another good example you very rarely yeah. see any large turbot they used to be enormous i mean the size of this desk mm -hmm. uh, wouldn't have been an unusual size for a turbot but you're talking about a 50 year old animal yes uh they don't get the chance to live that long anymore but is that's it, is, it not, is it not like especially in case of cod and turbot that's commercial fishing yeah co co which yeah. caused it yeah yeah yeah. Pretty much. I mean, the, the, that's why the Goliath grouper is a good example for, for, for sea angling. But you could make similar claims, for example, if we were allowing, um, you know, if, if it was an ongoing issue of catch and kill for even shark species, mm -hmm. you're, you know, you could potentially have that level of impact on, on local populations. If Macros that were to, are gone. If, if that was the case. But luckily, what we're seeing now from... Uh, recreational sea angling is a move from catch and kill to catch and release mm -hmm. catch tag and release often but catch yeah. and release by yeah. and large yeah so i mean is there an impact there still is an impact obviously if you spend two hours struggling with the fish and landing it it, it you know you, you you've had a significant impact on that fish now will it recover it may not all of them do mm -hmm. necessarily but it, it may well recover but what if someone else comes along the next day and catches that and mm -hmm. does the whole thing again? You know, what, what yeah. are the recovery rates? It's very hard to determine. Hopefully the, yes. the tagging data will give us that kind of information long term. But definitely mm -hmm. catch and release and particularly catch tag and release is much preferable than removing those fish, mm -hmm. especially the big fish no, uh, from I, those I, populations. I, I think that in case of six gill shark, there is, you know, hard to say about retaining that fish because it's size of the boat. Well, I mean, I think, you know, the, the, you know, you might say, well, the chance of commercial uh, or recreational sea angling having an impact as six skill shark is minuscule because you catch so few of them. Mm -hmm. But then again, six skill sharks may be so rare that mm -hmm. even catching low numbers of them mm -hmm. may have an impact on populations locally. Yeah. We don't know. I mean, to the honest answers, yeah. we don't know. But we, we have seen that kind of impact elsewhere. Okay. So. Okay. And you don't have much many recordings of the of the six gill sharks? I would have to check the database. Yeah. But uh, I mean, I'd say most of the records are probably from bycatch from various fisheries. So okay. Probably I, the I, can I can send a few. Probably the... I yeah, send, yeah. No, I, can, I mean, I it's, like I say, any any information mm. at all, we're, we're really... Yeah. Uh, and the reason I'm, I'm kind of, of digging you know, into that, because that's, uh, you know, my 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 good friend uh, who is running a charter, charter mm. boat, um, he was on this podcast. I don't remember the number of episodes. Um, Luke Aston is his name. Yeah. Um, you, you, you know, you know, him. I know. Yeah. Yeah. So, so he, he's, uh, you know, he even advertised on the, on his website, mm -hmm. uh, fishing for six gill shark and yeah. that, that become a kind of a, 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 a subject with a, a lot of people, you know, taking an issue with that. Mm -hmm. And this is why I'm kind of digging deeper into that to have an understanding myself, you know, even to answer a question, like if I go with him fishing for six gill shark, am I doing something wrong and I really shouldn't be doing that? Or it's not really that impactful and I, you know, I can do that. And and I, I think, you know, one of the messages in that podcast is like, especially hunters and anglers who are interacting with environment and nature in a potentially lethal way, really should ask those questions themselves and have these conversations before, you know, somebody else turns out and, and there's a different conversation and, and this is why this is kind of like a repeated subject <laughs> you know, yeah. so, so I thought I'm going to ask you and that hopefully helps me and other people build their own picture and make their decision whether they should or shouldn't do you know, well, of course you were, we're living in a world where the, 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 the trend for most marine fish species is downwards especially if they have a commercial value um so it's you know i think it is sea angling is becoming a, a it's being incorporated more into consideration and, and management and quotas and stuff mm -hmm. like that and you saw the recent moves with tuna mm -hmm. um you know 
basically trying to divert people from catching tuna, which are an extremely um, rare species in the yeah. North Atlantic due to overfishing, and trying to encourage people rather than doing that to tag mm. and release, which yes. it, it generates useful data yes. then um, to better understand the Especially if bluefin is like big, oh, the bluefins are back. Bluefins return. They are back. And, and there it, are yeah, then. Yeah. So we, we already but covered it, that. It, it doesn't necessarily mean there's more of them. It exactly. means they're here. Exactly. Uh, so that's a population which was yeah. pushed yeah. through the change of climate or whatever that is. Exactly. People always assume, not always, but quite, quite often people will assume because they see more of something that it's more common, but it may not necessarily be, especially in a marine environment where populations move quite freely and easily. Yeah. You can have the same number of animals or a much fewer number of animals just shifting populations. Suddenly, people become aware of them. Yeah. Um, but, for example, you know, in many areas in the Mediterranean, if you ask about bluefin tuna, they'll mm -hmm. tell you they have near yeah, they're terminal gone. decline. They're almost gone, yeah. yeah. Um, so we have to be careful in, in, in not assessing that way. Plus, there's, you know, certainly a way in the past I used to angle, and that there is a basic premise that if you're not going to eat it, yes, and you've no value in it that way, why would you kill the... I would. I have no thing, idea why, you know? would you, why would you kill something that you're not going to yeah. eat. Um, I mean, just, just that's, grand. If, if The thing in fishing is the catching and, and, and recovery of the fish. If you're not going to use it, just put the... Yeah, thing back yeah. and oh, uh, oh, absolutely. You know, I, you know, to seems be honest, to make more sense on all levels. I can't imagine anyone, you know, killing a fish and not eating it. Hmm. I like that. That's I, I, I just, I just can't imagine why someone would do that. And just, just to briefly come back to bluefin tuna. So there is already, I know, in the Ireland and also in the UK, the programs are a little bit different, but they're based on recreational anglers to actually tag them and there's a number of boats or a number of anglers who are part of the program to gather the data and, and see what's going on right so yeah i think I, those, I those that boats have now been licensed i mean it yeah. was an issue that iron had no actual catch quota for bluefin tuna so in, mm -hmm. in effect if you're catching and landing a bluefin tuna you were um, not doing something you should have been doing perhaps yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, i think was the the suggestion um so by license but but yet people wanted recreational anglers wanted yeah. to go out and, and have have a go at, at, at landing a, a bluefin yeah. or, or catch a bluefin so i think this was a, a way of doing that whilst doing yeah. something i think there's with five it, or you know? 15 both both yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not in, sure. in, in, I'm in ireland who mm. can actually go and certainly and we're seeing much mm -hmm. more commonly we're seeing bluefin tuna um, right. certainly off the south coast but also you know you Get them around the north west coast as well. Yeah. Um, and there's even been some records from the RC. So. Last question is specific to species. Uh, and it's, it's going to be uh, land, terrestrial species. Any any views on reintroduction of wolves? <laughs> uh, yeah, I saw that in the paper the other day. Yeah, it's an interesting one. Um, it's kind of linked to your earlier deer question. You know, what do you need? It is actually. What do you is. need to reintroduce something? Um, you need uh, habitat. Uh, you need sufficient prey. Um, um, you need a landowner. You tolerance. need tolerance, I suppose. That's another key, key, key issue. Um, and some way of managing or mitigating their impact on, let's say, commercial species. Yeah. Um, do I have a personal opinion? I mean, yeah, per, on a strictly personal level, I mean, at some point in the future, wouldn't it be great to see wolves back in Ireland? Right. I'm not a sheep farmer or a dairy farmer, as yeah, you can tell. Yeah, that would but, really impact your but, view on that. Um, you know, there are certain areas of, of, of Sligo forested areas um, where there seems lots of habitat, but is it the right kind of habitat? Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm not, yeah, I, I don't know is the honest answer. I'm not yeah. convinced there's sufficient habitat to good habitat that's that's a point you to know to do it but i would you love know, it. i'm not an, i'm not a, a, a wolf expert on that yeah. level and you know i tell you i would love it but i just don't see how mm -hmm. i just don't see how i would love i would mm -hmm. i would genuinely love it i would love to have a big wilderness area mm -hmm. Where you have, I mean, we we do have big wilderness. I, I'm thinking of some of the forestry plantations area in Sligo, where it, it goes for miles and miles and yeah. miles. But I mean, is it forestry plantation probably isn't necessarily yeah. great wolf habitat. So, yeah. I mean, you know, but, but you know, some people point are the, throwing around Yellowstone, like the size of the of the greater Yellowstone yeah, ecosystem yeah. is like 
Like it's the, not even there's not even point plus, plus, making those plus comparisons. The habit, plus the habitat quality. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, at some point in the future, maybe if our habitat quality and yeah, we get the right kind of habitat quality, maybe maybe yeah. it'll become an option. But um, yeah. yeah, I I, I don't interesting. know. Interesting, interesting. Yeah, I like mm. like I said, I would love it, but I just don't see how. <laughs> Listen, Dave. Um, before we wrap this up, um, the the biggest really question and you already kind of said it in a way everything's like a biodiversity in 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 nature in general seems to be in a decline is is there is there like is there a way of turning that or is it the only way is just record just to see what we have and how quickly we're losing that stuff unfortunately yeah i mean it's it's not a good it's not a good picture of what we're doing in terms of biodiversity i mean you know we have a climate crisis a biodiversity crisis um for the species we do have trend data in mostly uh, the trends are not optimistic i mean mm. you know if you look at pollinator trends they're they're in decline bees and butterflies i mean like everything is in decline is there um, is there a species that's not in a decline other than than you know cockroaches, yeah, mag- magpies, yeah, <laughs> I don't know. yeah. <laughs> even even then, I wouldn't have the actual stats to tell you. Yeah. My hand on my heart. Um, yes, I mean it's it, it's it's not a it's not a bright picture. It's not a it's not a cheery picture. It's very important we get the data so we can assess exactly what's going on. So, for example, if you were to ask me what's the picture in terms of marine species, I can tell you about commercial fish species because we have the data. Mm, please. If you ask me whether things on the seashore are in decline or not, I couldn't tell you because we have no information to, to say that one way or the other. Hmm. Um, you know, so one would that assume we might lose that we don't even know exactly, what we're losing. You will lose it before you, you may lose it before you know it's, it's being lost. Hmm. Um, so that is a large part of what we're doing is trying to get that good baseline data and ongoing monitoring data afterwards. So at least we can see which way we're heading. I mean, can we reverse it? Yes, we can, but it's going to require a huge change mm-hmm. in mindset of the human is it not like population. With the, is it not like with the wolves, right? Like we mm. can, but how? We can by, I mean, you know, it's simple. If you look at the Irish pollinator plan, quite simple steps can bring about huge benefits in terms of just leaving things alone to grow wild, mm. um, not mowing your grass every day or every week, mm-hmm. um, <laughs> and just allowing the food sources to, to, to come up and flower, um, recreating quality habitats in terms of, let's say, forestry replantation, uh, plantation, but, you know, planting native species yes, that are rich, native woodlands rich rather in habitat. Than Sitka spruce, um, densely. <laughs> you know, so so we, we kind of know, it's not rocket science, we kind of know what we have mm-hmm. to do. The question is, do we have the will to do it? Mm-hmm. Um, it requires probably large changes in farming practice. We've gone for kind of high intensity farming. Certainly, I mean, just over the last 20 years, I'm sure I'm not the only one who's noticed how how farming practice in the countryside has changed, you know, to, to this high intensity growing of grass and mm-hmm. cropping of grass and baling and, and mm-hmm. this kind of activity, whereas previously you might have had more of cows out in the fields and, uh, you mm-hmm. know, hay making in some cases. Um, all of these things are having an impact. Um, spraying, pesticides, herbicides, yes. all of these act to reduce biodiversity. We've pollution. You know, almost everything we do, do in, it would appear uh, from driving our cars to spraying our crops. Is this has, phrase, has war, on, war of nature, right? Yeah, yeah. And I mean... To, to get around that, to, to reverse that, we have to change direction. We have to decide maybe to farm less intensively. We have to reduce our impacts on the ground, the earth around us, I suppose, in mm. terms of, you know, the forests and the, even at the grass at home and our lawns. You know, do yeah. we really need a perfectly green monocrop of lovely grass? Jesus. Or yeah. do you get 
are equally as much pleasure. I mean, my back garden's like a, <laughs> like a jungle. I leave the grass grow. And I, I have so many bees and pollinators yeah. in my back garden. And yes, the grass is long and scraggly. But you know what your so neighbors are saying what? about you? <laughs> my kids don't complain. Um, I don't complain. And I don't really care what the neighbors say about me. Um, That's the man. I'm happy to see that level of, of life in my in my back garden. Exactly. If I mow that every day or every week, um, I'd have nothing. Yeah. So it, really, it's it's a mindset. Unfortunately, I, I think we've become dissociated from nature quite a lot. Um, mm -hmm. You know, people f almost freak out when they see the wildlife remember. and see animals around them. Whereas maybe in our parents or our grandparents' generation, um, you know, we, we probably had a lot stronger links to nature. Hmm. Um, you know, we'd know a lot more about nature. I'm always shocked, I suppose, on the marine front of how few species people actually recognize mm -hmm. of common stuff, common intertidal stuff. They just yeah. don't know it. They don't recognize it. Yeah. They haven't been taught it. Yeah. Um, so if you can't recognize it, you don't know what it is. How can you learn to yeah. value it or to yeah. want to protect it? You know, I, I'm not sure about that. Previous generations had a better connection. Perhaps they had a better connection because the, those animals were more abundant. Uh, that's one. But, you know, the place where we are now, which is not great, mm. it has roots back there, right? Where there was like very little consciousness or conservation measures and you might say like oh you know my grand granddad has this farm and he was connected to nature and we have all this great biodiversity back then but guess what he was shooting and trapping every day i was he, but was, I mean, he was doing pretty much you know a lot of whittling but but yet his impact on his on the environment of the countryside was a lot lower than modern farmers in many cases mm. Um, and I'm not just picking out farmers. It goes for all of us. It goes yeah. for me. I mean, if I lived mm -hmm. 60 years ago, yeah. 80 years ago, I wouldn't be driving a car. Mm -hmm. I would, we wouldn't be a two car family. Mm -hmm. We wouldn't have central heating in our house, mm -hmm. which draws down on nature, on uh, energy reserves, which impacts that has energy has to come from somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, we wouldn't have computers. Mm -hmm. We wouldn't have I mean, if it was 80 or 100 years ago, we wouldn't have electricity. So we yeah. wouldn't be causing all the associated problems with the need to generate electricity. So as time has gone on, our impact on the environment has mm -hmm. just grown and grown and grown and grown. And that's not endlessly sustainable. It's yeah. only a, the earth is only a certain size. The, the resources in it are only a certain capacity. Mm -hmm. So we can't all just keep growing ad infinitum and expect the uh, the world around us to keep providing and i mean it, it's it's i suppose what's brought to the fore in our generation is it's beginning to have worrying results i mean yeah. we can see now possibly for the first time that the, the major impacts we can see dead zones in the sea mm -hmm. we can see noticeable increases in sea temperature and the impacts that's having on a whole range of species we can see the amount of our litter that pollutes the sea yeah. and the impact that having on species. So it, it, it's kind of got to such a poor state of affairs. We're beginning to really notice. Mm -hmm. Well, some of us are. A lot of people are still oblivious or choose perhaps mm -hmm. not to want to notice. Um, so you just wonder how bad things have to get before people will decide that they need to do something. Yeah. I suppose that's the worry. And that goes for climate change and that goes for biodiversity as well. How much do we have to lose before we decide we've yeah. lost enough? Or are we happy to go on until we're living in a world of rats, cockroaches and magpies? I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Does it get depressing from time to time? Because you're like so deep in this, right? You're actually in the business of recording sightings and species and so you are like on the front line <laughs> does it get does it get depressing do you sometimes wish you had a different job i was having a i was, I was just thinking about this uh, some conversation about business and biodiversity and people valuing things you know i suppose the way i'd put it to someone in a, in a business environment is how would you feel if every year for the past 35 years you were making a loss <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah but 
you can't afford to get depressed. You can't afford to stop. There's no point in stopping because nothing's going to improve on, on yeah. that level. Um, well, if you're so, getting I mean, depressed, at least your your personal well being. You, you, li- you like to think on some <laughs> level you can have small uh, you can have small um, victories, you know. But they, mm-hmm. they 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 do seem kind of few and far between. But um, I think certainly this role is quite an important one. Is is, is trying to generate that information. That will enable us to decide what way things are going and and perhaps provoke people into thinking about what we need to do mm-hmm. uh, to protect what we've got left and maybe reverse the trend in some cases. Yes. Um, it's not all negative, but the victories are few and far between. I think mm-hmm. that's, the, that's the issue. Can you give an example of... Well, I mean, in the marine environment, you know, you can think, well, okay, we have marine protected areas that we didn't have. Uh, many years ago, let's say 40 or 50 years ago. Unfortunately, most of them aren't very effective because there's almost no management within them. But there are the odd cases. You know, I'd have to go to Scotland really to think of a really good example Mm -hmm. um, of marine protected areas that work because they're highly protected, um, you know, know, and you can see the results of Mm -hmm. of that protection. And and the richness... Highly protected, you mean there's an enforcement in place. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, especially on bottom fishing. You know, I, I think a lot of people don't realize that up until the 80s, you know, we didn't have any real um, trawling within the, the three or mile limit or, mm-hmm. you know, close to shore and, and, and all that kind of damage that's been done to seafloor habitats is, is recent. Um, you know, certainly mm-hmm. my grandfather was a fisherman and I know for most of his fishing life, he rarely had to leave the bay he fished in. You know, there was enough there. Nowadays, there's almost nothing that you could certainly couldn't make a living of it. Hmm. Um, so th- obviously that's changed. And that that's why we need the data. We need to be able to understand where we've come from. We have this problem of shifting baselines where each yes. new generation thinks that, well, this is great. This is what I've been born into. This this is how the world's supposed to I, look. Exa- thanks for mentioning that because that was, I was going to bring that up. But it's yeah. only when you talk to your grandparents or you look at the history records, or you look at great grandparents or, or landing records from 100 years, you realize how much we've lost. Yeah. And what we've lost is so much. Mm-hmm. Um, but unless we're aware of that, we can't have any understanding of it. You were asking me about the importance of angling records. I mean, yes, anglers catch stuff and they, and they, quite often they'll record it and they'll put it in a notebook. The problem is, unless they submit it to agencies such as National Biodiversity Data Center, when when they die or give up angling or throw the logbooks out, all that information is gone. I, I mean, one mm. good example is my last job. We were looking at fisheries in Carlingford Lock. And they used to be great sea angling in current for a lot. Back in the 1800s, there was something like 20 boats operating mm-hmm. recreation angling in current for a lot. There was records for, it was a well-known hot spot for, um, for common skate, mm-hmm. for uh, taupe, for other shark species, for sea bass, mm-hmm. for mackerel herring. Nowadays, there's one boat, I think, operating out there. And most of what he catches is beyond the mouth of the lock. And the lock itself... As, yeah. as far as we can tell, and next to nothing in it. But all the angling data, um, because there were, there was a lot of sea angling went on in there, and it's potentially an example of somewhere where sea angling had an impact. Because there, certainly in the seventies, there used to be uh, competitions there, and there was descriptions of skips of fish being landed, you know, yeah. being being filled and then dumped. Yeah, um, you know, potentially that's, 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 thousands that's or tons of fish. Mm. annually for a few years and it seems like post that it it, it, it didn't recover Mm. um but if we had that information we'd be able to chart that we'd be able to understand it but all that information has been lost because the records have been lost they were never kept they were never submitted so this is why the message has to be it's so important that if you have an interest if you have a love for sea angling let's say if you have a love for snorkeling for diving it's really important that you help collect information on that environment that you're you're getting your enjoyment from you know to help that there's some prospect that down mm-hmm. the line in the future will still have the same environment available to yes. us absolutely that's a that's a very important message and and uh we're going to spread that message through the podcast dave any any final any final thoughts 
any final um i don't know message for f- for for the listeners my final message is get out explore the shore explore your shore go down rock pooling go for a walk on the beach go rambling around snorkeling diving whatever it is you're doing down on the coast while you're out there bring your camera obviously waterproof if you're in the water um record what you see take photos and then go online to exploreyourshore.ie and submit those records to us and help us build a good solid database and a better understanding of what we have around our coastline so we can then think about um how we're going to protect that into the future dave thanks thanks for your time and i will see you at ivorel learning landscapes looking forward to it